Well, it is good to be in the house, Lord. I mean, you know, one of the things I like, I like corporate singing. I like loud singing. We've got a bit of a crazy front line here. I'm going to have to be, I might go sit on that side. Hey, why don't you join with me? Let's worship the Lord.
The king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life for he is my song you are good good oh you are good good Put your hands on wherever you're sick. 
If you're watching online and you're sick in body somewhere, I just want to put your hand on wherever you're sick. If you've got a friend who is unwell or is facing a challenge, just stand in proxy. They did that in the Book of Acts. Just put your hand on where you're sick. And this morning, we're just going to believe for the power of God. Mighty God, where's Pastor Bill and Bev? I can't see in the dark. Some of you, uh, some of you people, just put up your hand there, Pastor Bill. Some of you people, I want you to gather around Pastor Bill and Bev. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to intercede for their son-in-law, James. He's in ICU. Hopefully he's coming out this week. And we're just going to believe for the power of God just to touch these people this morning. Mighty God, Father, we just thank You that You are mighty. We thank You that You've just sang, You are good, so good. And Lord, one of Your names is Jehovah Rapha. You are the Lord, our healer. And God, we pray for every person who is sick, every person who is unwell, every person who is just fighting a challenge. Mighty God, we just pray for Your healing touch now, oh God. Heal them. I pray for James in hospital. God, I pray the peace of God would just fall on them. I pray for, for, for Barbara this morning. Let the peace of God fall. Lord, I pray for all these people who are facing a challenge and fear is knocking on that door. Holy Ghost, I pray You answer that door. Hallelujah. God, I just pray for healing in Jesus' mighty Name. In Jesus' mighty Name. In Jesus' Name. Hey, we've just been singing about the goodness of God. I want you to get your communion ready. And I want to read you a verse about the goodness of God. You know, there's two reasons why we have communion. We take communion so we can remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we also take communion so we can remember to celebrate all that that death and resurrection has given us. So let me just read from Titus chapter 3. I want you to, as I'm reading, I want you to remember where you were and where you are now. In Titus chapter 3, Paul says, For we ourselves were once foolish, that's me, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us. Now listen to this, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out for us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. What a verse. It's all because of the goodness of God. Let's take our wafer. Lord, this morning we remember that You lived a life that we could not live and You died a death that we could not die so that we could have access to the Father and we remember and we thank You. Let's partake together. Thank You. And Lord, we remember Your precious blood that You shed for us. Lord, that precious blood that's washed our sins away. That precious blood that has washed those blotches off us. That precious blood that gives us access to the Father. We thank You for that. And we partake together. Hallelujah. Mighty God. Mighty is that God. Hey, we want to welcome you to church this morning. Good morning, 10.30 Anthem. All right, now we're going to practice this anthem. So the 8.30 service is possibly louder than you guys. Like, good morning, 10.30 Anthem. We're going to get better at this. This is really good. Hey, I just want to uh, just want to say, if you are new here, if you've never come before and you're sitting here and you're going, what is this all about? You know, our church is here for one reason, and that's so we can help you know God. 
not know about God. We want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. And Pastor Josh is going to talk about that in a moment. We want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. We want you to discover purpose. And we want you to make a difference in this world. That's what we're here for. So if you're here and you haven't been before, come out the back afterwards. Say hello. Say hello to me or Pastor Gary. We'll give you a free cup of coffee. We just want to share our story. And we want to hear your story. And if you reckon you want to just go on the journey and walk with us, that's going to be a good day. We're going to have a lot of fun. Hey, I want you to do me a favour. I want you to watch the screen. We're going to show you a few announcements and then we're going to talk to you about something special. Thanks, mate. It's great to have you at Anthem Church today. As a church, our desire is for each person to know God, find freedom, discover a sense of purpose, and to make a difference in the world. If you are new to the church and are looking to connect, stop by the Connect Hub located to your left as you exit the auditorium. Some of our team will be there to meet you, put a coffee in your hands, chat with you, and help answer any questions you have. We believe the best way to connect into the life of a church is to join a connect group or the volunteer teams. We try to make this as simple as possible and you can do it in one of three ways. One, you can connect in person at our connect hub and the team there will help you get connected. Two, you can fill out the next steps card in the pocket of the seat in front of you. You'll notice these cards have room to ask for a prayer, offer a testimony, or to indicate if you are new to the Christian faith. Thirdly, you can connect online. Our website is purposefully easy to navigate with links to everything you need. Finally, if you'd like to give today, there are a couple of ways to do so. On the Next Steps card in front of you, there is a QR code on the front with links to online giving and a giving section on the back. You can also visit the team at the Connect Hub who can assist with other giving options. We pray God's continued favour over your finances, that you'll have more than enough to be generous on every occasion. Bless God. Hey, I just want to talk about two things uh, very quickly. Uh, ways that you can be a blessing in the community. Uh, there were two times in my life as a young husband with four little kids that I used to cry. One was Christmas and one was February. Christmas, because we just never had enough money and it was a difficult time. And uh, one of the things that we're doing as a church this year is we're doing our Joy to the World bags. Now, I wanna encourage you. There are a lot of families out there in this world at the moment who are really struggling. And uh, this is just a very simple way that you guys can all chip in and uh, we want the non-perishable foods. I'm not quite sure what that means, but my wife would. We want the non-perishable foods. <laughs> Fill up the bag uh, and bring it in. And I think last year we might have given out nearly 100, maybe even more. It was just great. And all that means is there are families out there who all of a sudden will bring up praise to God because someone has stepped in and just helped them. The other time I used to cry as a father with four kids was the first week in February. Because the first week in February, the kids all went back to school and the cost of stationery was staggering. Again, there are a whole lot of families out there who are really struggling. So one of these, this year, so I don't know who it was, but one of our team came up with this brilliant idea about uh, chipping in and giving these families a stationary box. And do you know what? If nothing else, all that does is it just helps these families and these little kids go to their first day at school and they're no different from other people. You know, they're, they're on the ball and we've got a chance. And do you know what happens? Praise to God goes up because we have done something. Now, I know some of you are struggling. I know you don't have a whole lot of money. Park, be at ease. But you people like me who, you know, you've done that journey and you've got some extra, let's just chip in. Let's work out how we can do something to help people and let praise go up to heaven. Amen. Hey, why don't you do me a favour? Why don't you stand up? I want you for one minute, find people you haven't met haven't said hello. There's a whole lot of people on this side that I haven't met yet, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit that way in a minute. If you're an introvert, run for cover because the extroverts are coming. And then our lead pastor, Josh Bradford, is gonna come and preach.
Well, good morning, everybody. Good to have you here today. Welcome. Great to have you in church. Grab your seats if you can. That'd be fantastic. I just want to echo uh, the welcome that the team have extended. It's nice to have you here if you're visiting with us. Uh, it's good to be together uh, in our uh, 10.30 service. It's great to see what God's doing across the community at the moment um, in so many areas. So welcome. Uh, welcome this morning. Uh, I came uh, on my way here today. I have a real sense and uh, that the Holy Spirit has an agenda and a purpose and a, and a and a plan for these services today, and particularly today's service. I always am I'm seeking what He's wanting to do, and we are a spirit-led church. We're not a, uh, you know, we're not led by you know human knowledge and the wisdom of man. We trust in the wisdom of the Spirit. And I just, as we were, as I was uh, preparing for today, and particularly as I, I as I came this morning, had a real sense that Holy Spirit uh, is wanting to do something for some people today. Uh, and, and you are going to walk in a freedom uh, that you have either not experienced in a very long time or that you have never experienced in your life before. Um, and so today, uh, I, I'm believing for uh, just a freedom to enter in and just to be released over every life. Um, and that doesn't come uh, through a message. That comes only by the Spirit of freedom, the Holy Spirit. And so can we just take a moment as we begin and ask Him to, to just do what He needs to do? Can you just uh, um, you know, open up your heart and, and just be open to what He's wanting to do? Holy Spirit, we come today and uh, we know You are good. We know You love us. Uh, and You're not here uh, to manipulate us or control us. You're here to bring us and walk us into freedom. So I pray today that You would speak, that You would open our hearts that you would lead people into freedom. I just come against the, the spirit of legalism uh, that, that would try and rob people of freedom. I come against uh, the, the spirit of the world that would try and keep people bound in sin. And I just declare uh, freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. Come on, and if you believe that today, why don't we say good amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Um, well, today I'm talking about the Spirit-led life, and Min did such a wonderful job setting this up uh, last week, talking about how Jesus was led by the Spirit. Um, but this week I want to talk about what it means to live the simple Spirit-led life. You know, I often joke with our team that I have a technology anointing. Uh, they will be there working with a piece of equipment, a uh, piece of technology, and I'll come up and lay hands on it. Um, not literally like, like, like I'll just touch it and somehow uh, that uh, piece of equipment just automatically starts to work. Uh, some of you have the opposite to that. You touch the technology and it breaks. Anybody got that gift? Uh, that's good. I'll, I'll call you if we ever need to defuse a bomb or something like that. Um, but... Um, but uh, the, the amount of times I find them struggling with it, so that's, that, again, is not an invitation to ask me to lay hands on all your computers. When we took over the, uh, the church a number of years ago, we had an older uh, congregation who was part of our community, um, and many of them are still here, but they would often bring me their computers because I was a young guy, and I would lay hands on their computers. Amen, Pastor Bill. <laughs> uh, and, so, um, and so this is not a chance for computer deliverance today. Uh, but one of the reasons I think I can solve technical issues pretty quickly um, is because I understand how it works and uh, I can sort of get to the root of issues uh, pretty quickly. Once you understand it, you can generally get to the root of the issue fairly quickly unless you're an Optus technician. Then it takes about eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> Too soon? I'm with Telstra, so I'm all good. <laughs> this, is why, um, this is why when you call uh, technical support, uh, generally they will say, have you turned it on and off again? That Roy, Roy from IT Crowd, you got it. It's usually the first question they ask because it's often a hard reset solve so many of the problems uh, because usually we've got 20,000 applications open and running in the background, 200 tabs, uh, and, uh, and it can get complicated. So uh, generally it's good to regularly reset your computer and just bring it back to the basics. Um, and it helps things function as they should. I think sometimes people face this same issue with their Christian faith. We overcomplicate the Christian faith. And sometimes it's actually important to, uh, you know, turn it on and off again, proverbially speaking, come back to the basics 
and really bring it back to what it's all about. Um, if your Christianity is complicated, if it's arduous, if it's heavy, if it's burdensome, if it's exhausting, if it's complicated, if you're overwhelmed with where to start and what to do in your Christian life, uh, listen, if, even if, you're, if your Bible reading and your prayer life feels exhausting and more like work than it does joy, then I actually think that there is an invitation of the Holy Spirit to turn it on and off again to come back to the foundation and the basics. Uh, Paul wrote this letter called the Galatia, to the church uh, of, in Galatia, which he planted, he founded, uh, and he really gave them this invitation to come back to the simplicity of the faith that they had uh, been born again into. Uh, he writes this letter and it's quite a jarring, confronting letter in chapter three, verse one. He writes, Oh foolish Galatians. Uh, that's a good way to, to start a, a letter, isn't it? Sometimes. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That word there is who has cast a spell over you? Who has bamboozled you? Who has fooled you or tricked you? Uh, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly crucified. Let me ask you this, he goes on to say, did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit he's talking about, by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? I find it interesting, he's like, let me ask you only this. And then he asks like five questions. This next question is, are you so foolish? Have, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by uh, the flesh? Um, that word perfected is brought into completion. Are you trying to complete the journey and be whole and righteous by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He is writing to this church that he planted, uh, a Gentile church, quite a confronting letter. It gets even harder in, in chapter four and five. He gets pretty brutal with them. Uh, and this church had, had come to faith by simply believing the gospel and then being filled with the Holy Spirit and then walking out a simple Spirit-led life where uh, he where the Holy Spirit moved through them and in them and uh, did miracles amongst them. And He who began the work was there to complete the work and it was light and it was easy. And there was this group of people who come into the church in Galatia, uh, who were, we think are the, the Judaizers. And they were quite simply uh, people who had believed that somehow the, the uh, Gentile Christians needed to adhere to the law uh, to the Jewish practices, to the Torah, to circumcision and all of these other things in order to walk out their faith. And so Paul's letter is jarring. Like it's a, it's a bit of a hard reset for them. It's like a, guys, who has put a spell on you? Like who has bewitched you? You know, uh, you, you began in this light and easy life. It was easy. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, there was challenges and you suffered things, but in terms of your faith, it was uncomplicated and it was led by the Spirit. And now someone has, has convinced you that the simple Spirit-led life of faith is not enough. I wanna ask this question or propose this thought to us today that if it's possible for the Galatian church to be bamboozled, to be brought under uh, some kind of a, a bewitchment, I think it's possible for believers today to come under the same confusion and complication of their faith. I think it's possible for us to uh, start in freedom and then find ourselves somehow burdened and complicated and overwhelmed with all of these things. We may not have Judaizers these days convincing us that we need to you know, adhere to the Mosaic law, but we do live in the information generation. And there are more podcasts, books and knowledge on how to do Christianity 
than, than there ever has been in all of history. I mean, just go to Kurong uh, and I go in there and I'm like overwhelmed with the amount of information. And, and listen to me, many of it is great information. It's helpful. I've bought many of those books. But sometimes our Christian faith because we are consuming so much, so many different opinions and so many different perspectives and, uh, and ways of outworking Christianity can be a little bit like me with my computer sometimes. Uh, and we can end up having 25 different programs running and 150, 200 tabs open. I didn't even know my phone had tabs until my kids told me and they opened it up and they're like, Dad, you've got 500 tabs open. I'm like, is that why I can't open, open the internet on my phone? They're like, that's right. Uh, you've got too many tabs open. And, and, and sometimes that's our Christian life. We're just ah, overwhelmed. And we wonder why it's hard to live that simple spirit-led life. You know, no matter how many uh, parenting books I've read, and I've read a lot, uh, nothing, nothing trumps the wisdom of the spirit in parenting my kids. And the amount of conversations I've had with them and they're like, how did you know? And I'm like, well, I have the Holy Spirit and he gives me wisdom. And sometimes in those conversations, things come out of my mouth that I'm like, oh man, that is genius. Oh, that did not come from me. And they're like, dad, you are so wise, aren't you? No, they're not. They're shaking their head. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, no matter how many leadership books I've read and on leading churches, and I've read a few leadership books on leading churches. Nothing beats or comes even close to hearing and knowing and obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit as a leader. You know, a couple of years ago, before COVID, 2019, I felt, uh, I felt uh, laid in my heart, the Holy Spirit, uh, that we should get uh, camera risers and set up our church for live streaming. This was before COVID, 2019, December. And so I talked to the team about it. We prayed about it. We said, you know what? That's a good thing to do. So we started setting up for live streaming. We were set up at the end of January. And then February 2020 hit. And uh, we were ready to go for what was a very challenging season in the church. So much so that we were actually able to then have the headroom to help other churches set up their live streaming setup because I'd just spent a few months doing that so I knew how it worked and what to do. Nothing trumps the wisdom of the Holy Spirit uh, and being led by the Holy Spirit, I think, is more about uh, living an uncluttered, simple um, walk with God than it is being kind of a spooky, crazy-eyed Christian. Some people think that this is what, you know, you know that they're, they're the real, you know, if that's, if that's what the whole, and some people are like, if that's what the Holy Spirit's like, I'm out, right? Um, maybe that's it. But for some people, because you meet those people and they kind of they got that crazy look in, the, in their eye, right? Don't look sideways right now when I draw attention to anyone in the room. But, but the, the reality is that, that so much of the Christian walk is about learning to simply abide in the Spirit, know His voice, and walk in obedience to that voice. Hey, listen, sometimes obedience to that voice does look weird. I've done some weird things in obedience to the Holy Spirit. But so often, it's in that step of faith that there's breakthrough and incredible things happen. So I'm not dismissing the supernatural, but it's so often grounded in the simple. Does that make sense? And I think as a society, there's this undercurrent that wants to pull us towards complexity instead of simplicity. The, the tide of the world is, has a pull to complexity. Um, and we don't drift to simplicity, we drift to complexity as humans, don't we? We tend to complicate life, but the Spirit-led life is not complicated. Let me say that again. The Spirit-led life is not complicated at all. Receiving the Holy Spirit and walking in the Holy Spirit is not complicated. And sometimes for some people, that is actually the problem because they're looking for a formula when it's a gift. They're looking for 
uh, you know, a process when it's a relationship. They're looking for something that uh, isn't there. And, so, and as Paul said, it's as simple as hearing with faith. But like he says, we can also find ourselves, I think, as we go through, because there is a the pull to uh, complexity in life, that we can find ourselves uh, in bondage, needing to come back to the basics. And so I, I want to kind of come back to the basics today and say, so what, and to help us sort of understand what it looks like to walk in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. So what does it actually look like to walk in the Spirit? Jesus spoke of this. He spoke of a light and easy yoke. This is the promise of Jesus for the Christian faith. It is not a complicated, burdensome, arduous, heavy, uh, exhausting yoke. It's a light and easy yoke. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are labour who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, a yoke has a twofold meaning in Scripture. The first one is uh, oxen. In fact, I'm going to get our service pastors, Gary and Jeff, to come up uh, to illustrate this today. And what would happen is uh, when a farmer was ploughing a field, he would take a yoke, uh, which was like a, uh, like a, it would join the two oxen together. So you can put your shoulders around one another. Uh, and what, what would happen is there would be a, a yoke that would go across the shoulders and join these, usually the older oxen uh, would take the lead and the younger oxen uh, would, uh, would follow. And so the, the old ox would train, <laughs> sorry, mate, I couldn't do that around the other way this service, would train the young ox on how to walk. And so there was a yoke that they would wear, uh, they would, they, that would be placed upon them. And then there was a walk and there was a pace to that walk that was set by the oxen that had maturity. And they would drag behind them a, an implement that would plow up the ground behind them. You guys can take your seats. So thank you guys, well done. You'll be back in a minute. So, so there was a yoke, there was a walk, and there was a wake. A yoke, a walk, and a wake. The second, uh, I guess, um, understanding of a yoke we have in Scripture is the yoke that a, um, a rabbi would, would have uh, that he would train his followers in. A yoke was best understood as, as a rabbi's interpretation of the divine revelation. So every, different, every rabbi would have a different understanding or interpretation of the Torah and that rabbi would then train their students in the way of the Torah that would produce a wake or fruit in their life. So you have a yoke, a way of interpreting the Torah, a walk, how that actually applied to the life of the follower of that rabbi. And then you had behind them a wake or the way in which that then outworked and produced in their life fruit. Are you following me today? A yoke, a walk and a wake. So this light and easy yoke that Jesus promised was very different than any other rabbi that was out there. The yokes that they were offering were heavy, they were arduous, they were religious. And Jesus promises this yoke. And then he takes off. He's, he's like, I've trained you for a few years, see you later. But he doesn't take off and leave the disciples on their own, does he? He says to his disciples, I'm going, but I'm going to send to you one who will walk with you who will abide with you. In fact, he calls him, the Holy Spirit, the parakletos. That's the Greek term there, the parakletos. And the word parakletos means somebody who is summoned, called to one side. Are you getting the picture here? Somebody who's called to one side, especially called to one's aid. One who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader or a counsel for defence, a legal assistant and an advocate. 
If you think about the job of a legal assistant or a defence attorney or an advocate, their job is to correctly interpret the law and present the best case for you to walk in freedom. Are you following me here today? That, that's, that's what a defence attorney does. So when the accusations come, there is uh, in place someone who is walking on, who is on your side, advocating for you and to you of uh, the freedom that hopefully you have from the accusations that are based around the legal system. Are you following me today? Okay. So we are born again and we are yoked to the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says we are born of the Spirit. It, and it's meant to literally, the Christian life, I believe is meant to be as simple as trusting and obeying and walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit and letting the parakletos, our advocate, walk alongside us. But like the Galatians discovered, it's very easy to get bamboozled, particularly when there are so many other, listen to me, there are so many other yokes or interpretations out there. There are so many other perspectives that exist. So how do we know if we've been bamboozled and how do we know if we are uh, walking out the light and easy Spirit-led life. Well, I want to propose to you today that firstly, the yoke of the Spirit-led life is defined, it's marked by freedom. It's marked by freedom. Uh, in fact, Paul says this, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of Slavery. Paul is it's, he's interesting because he's calling this bewitchment that the Galatians have been brought into uh, uh, in Galatians chapter 5. He's calling what they were entering into the same. It's, it's interesting because he says, don't be brought under the yoke of slavery again. Now, he's talking about buying into the adherence to the Mosaic law. What I find interestingly interesting here is these were Gentiles. They were never under the law, right? But so Paul's actually calling uh, this uh, ego, so, and I'm going to use this term, this egocentric approach to Christianity where I play the role uh, in uh, defending myself in, in approaching God uh, as the same uh, yoke of slavery as someone who is lost and bound in sin. And that is quite a strong statement Paul makes here. In fact, he said, if you wanna go down that way, you are, you are actually cut off from Christ. You've fallen from grace. If you allow that yoke to come upon you. The spirit led yoke we are meant to enjoy is marked by freedom. And so if you think of the Holy Spirit um, as an advocate, as a defence attorney, as somebody who is uh, standing before God as your judge and the accuser who is the enemy, the Holy Spirit's ministry or His yoke, the way He interprets uh, the divine revelation from God, the way, he, the way He interprets the will of God and the heart of God for us and to us on our behalf is all about bringing us into freedom. You know, an accuser really only has an accusation. Listen to me. The accuser only can bring an accusation if there is a law that they can pin you on. So if there is no, nothing kind of written into Queensland law, then uh, no accusation that the prosecution could ever bring would stand because there is not a law that backs up the accusation. Am I making sense today? And so uh, an accuser only has this accusation. And if they can prove that this person has breached the law, then that person is guilty. Now, the Holy Spirit's defence in response to the accuser in our life is absolutely 
rock solid. And listen to me, this is his primary ministry. This is what his yoke is to us. This is what he is wanting to train us in the revelation of and help us walk in. That Jesus stood in our place, that he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. And in Christ, we are not condemned, but we are free. And that is the Holy Spirit's ministry in the life of the believer. That's His yoke. That's His best defence to all present. And it's totally aligned with the will of the Father and the will of Jesus. And it's what He's training you and I to walk in and understand. The accuser goes, well, what about, what about Ben's past behaviour? The law says this, and the, our paracletos, the yoke, the one who we're walking with goes, well, let me just check my records. Let me check my interpretation of the facts. Well, it says here that, well, firstly, there's no record. And it says here that, that Ben died with Christ and the life he now lives, he lives by faith in him. And so your accusation has no legal authority to bring condemnation to Ben. He is free. He who the Son sets free, come on, is free indeed. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. The accuser says, well, hold on a minute. What about the law that says that, that this person should be, should be circumcised? And the defendant stands there and they go, I'm paracletos. Uh, what do you think? The Judaizers are like, yeah, what about all of that? What about all of that? And the Holy Spirit says, well, well, you're free if you want to get circumcised. Like I set you free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. But you're putting yourself through a lot of pain and you're also making the decision to prove your innocence on your own. And so my best defence for you is not circumcision or adherence to the law. In fact, I don't have another defence. You're choosing to stand on your own in your own righteousness if you choose to approach God through adherence to the law. And this is what Paul was speaking about. Are you getting the picture this morning? The Holy Spirit's interpretation of the divine revelation and His ministry to us is freedom. His conviction uh, that He brings is always to bring us into freedom. As He convicts us of sin, it's to bring us into what? Freedom. As he, as he, it's never to bring us into condemnation and bondage. His, his leading in our life and His discipline in our life is always to bring us out of brokenness and into freedom. It's never about placing us under the yoke of bondage. It's never about bringing us under that, that, that bondage and, and uh, condemnation. The mark of His yoke, His leading and His Lordship is this. And so if your Christianity is, is heavy, if it's burdensome, if it's filled with condemnation and accusations, if it's like you've got the weight of the world always on your shoulders, then I propose to you that you're not walking yoked to the spirit of freedom. I know those are strong words, but that is the words of Paul. That's what Paul's saying to the church here. It's not his yoke. The Holy Spirit's... I need to have a drink. Oh, that was good. The Holy Spirit's primary ministry in the life of the believer is the ministry of righteousness. That there is now peace with God. That there is now peace between you and the Father. That is His primary ministry to the believer. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. There is freedom and liberty. When we trust His leading, what happens is, he takes that weight off us, that yoke of bondage off us, takes the pressure of all of our past behaviour, all the guilt of that, and the pressure to perform and be, and walks with us 
in the light and easy life. His yoke is marked by freedom. And so if you're walking through life and your Christianity feels tiring and exhausting, then the invitation is to take on the light and easy yoke. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to get hard and you're not going to face persecution and there are not going to be moments when you're exhausted and weary. But our faith should have a life-giving element to it, right? It should feel life-giving. And so the, the, the yoke of the Spirit is freedom and the walk of the Holy Spirit is this. The walk of the Holy Spirit uh, is intended uh, to uh, bring us freedom from all other yokes. It says this in Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I, I feel like a lot of people believe the lie that they're walking with God um, in terms of in step with God when there's constant accusation and condemnation. And, and listen to me, the voice of the Spirit is not the voice that accuses us. He is the voice that advocates for us. And so a lot of people in their relationship with God have this sense that God is there going, come on, buddy, suck it up. You're not doing, come on, get, get up off the ground. How are you ever going to make it to heaven with that going on in your life? Come on, can you just deal with this once and for all? Come on, get this baggage off you. Come on, you're not good enough. And, and, and this sense that, that, that God is constantly just like, like picking on you like a bad mother-in-law. I don't know what they like, but constantly like, come on, <laughs> constantly, that's my brother-in-law there, I'm not going to say anything, but constantly like, like this is people's idea of the, of the yoke, the, of the Holy Spirit, this is what it looks like to walk with God, you're never good enough, you're never there, you need to, come on, come on, come on buddy, you're just not good enough, and I had this, I was driving here today and I realised, man, so many people think God is a slave driver when He's a friend. So, so many people think, that some, some people's Christian life is like they're in a chain gang instead of actually walking free. The yoke of the Spirit is actually freedom. And, and listen to me, it's actually scary how much freedom He brings us into because He wants to bring you out of bondage and to, into a place where you are actually, you're not actually bound to Him. That's why it says, keep in step with the Spirit. Why would the Scripture say, keep in step or stoichia with the Spirit if somehow uh, we were chained to Him in terms of, and not able to have a, a walk of freedom? The, the actual journey with the Holy Spirit is, is a relational, life-giving journey where, where you partner with Him. It's a back to the garden. It's a back to that place where you walk with Him in the cool of the day as a friend with God. And you partner and walk with them. And there's joy, there's joy to it. It's just so free. It's actually more free than what we could ever imagine. But Paul says this, just don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't go and use the freedom that you've been brought into to go and serve yourself. You're free from yourself so you can actually serve other people. Yeah. That's what it looks like. And so... I just have this heart for people that, that, are, that, are, that can see this relationship with God as this burdensome, exhausting, religious obligation. I mean, if, if, if your prayer life and Bible reading, all of those things feel more like that, exhausting, or I'm obligated to do this, then you're doing it wrong. It's, it's a joy and it should be a joy. It should bring us life. Now, this scripture says, but walk by the Spirit. And this is key because I think a lot of people in their walk, um, it's, it's exhausting because they've been convinced to, to carry a yoke that ties them to 
the flesh, and we're going to get to this in just a minute. It says this in the scripture, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to, under, yeah, if you've got a Bible, that's worth underlining, will not. Now, it doesn't say walk in the spirit and then try as hard as you can to not give in to the desires of the flesh. It doesn't say that. It says walk in relationship, yoked to the spirit at the pace of the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, this is significant for some of us today because I grew up in church with an illustration that they would often use in this text that is not in the Bible. And the illustration was this. If you have two dogs uh, and they're fighting and they're engaged in a fight, one dog is the spirit and the other dog is the flesh. Which dog is going to win? Does anyone know what the answer is? The one that you feed the most. Has anybody heard that in church before? Well, I just want to let you know that's not in the Bible. And I propose to you that having two natures constantly at war within you uh, and, and feeding one more is the way to outwork the Christian life. I propose to you that the Christian life is about putting one of those dogs down. And a lot of people have this mentality of like, there's the spirit and there's my flesh and I, I'm engaged in this internal battle of these two natures that are within me and if I keep feeding the spirit, then eventually he'll be stronger than the, like, do you, do you understand that? Like eventually he'll be stronger than the flesh. Like walk in the spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. I, I propose to you that as we put that dog down, it's actually like, it's like Paul says in the, the book of Romans that we must reckon ourselves or consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. We, we should reckon our ego, our old nature, the old yoke that we carried, the, the sinful nature that drove our life. Because before you were born again, that sin nature drove your life, right? It's what led us. And so what Paul is saying is, don't, can, don't give even, even any room or consideration for that nature. Reckon it dead. Consider it dead. And so walking in the Spirit is actually more about Reckoning the old leader of your life dead as crucified, as buried and giving no room or consideration for it in your life. And a lot of people still struggle to walk in the Spirit. And this is key. They struggle to enjoy the freedom of the Spirit because they still believe they're yoked to this dead man. I'm going to give an illustration of this. Guys, you can come up today. Uh, we've got an illustration. Sorry, guys. If... Christ, if with Christ you died, this is what Paul says as well in Colossians, this is Paul's whole theme, died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still, listen to me, why as if you were still alive, why as if ego is still alive, would you, would you actually submit to its regulation, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? These things have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the flesh. Okay, this is key for us today. It's not that you need to starve the old nature. You can be the old nature in this today, Jeff. <laughs> See, a lot of people think it's about, I'm the Holy Spirit today. Sorry, I get, I'm in charge, I got the microphone. But it's not about, this is you. This, it's not about um, there's a war going on. Uh, it's, it's actually about not starving you. It's actually about killing him. <laughs> uh, and so what, but this, here's the problem. Here's the problem. What the law does, what legalism does, and this is what Paul's confronting, because when we're born again, that thing, 
is crucified. But what the law wants to do is yoke you. It wants to yoke you to ego. It wants to yoke you to the dead flesh. You can pretend you're dead. Thanks, Jeff. Here we go. Good job. Do we have modesty cloth here? Uh, Okay. All right. So what, the, what legalism does, and this is what Paul's talking about. Paul's like, you, you were free. You were once free to walk with the Spirit and the Spirit of God led your life in freedom. You, you were dead. That's why Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in Him. I, ego or I died. But what the law does, what legalism does, is it chains us, binds us back, yokes us to the flesh again. And what we do is, is, is we kind of drag this dead, stinking <laughs> body around and we can't walk in the freedom that God has for us. And the Holy Spirit wants to walk you and lead you into freedom. But if you're entertaining legalism, performance-based Christianity, then you can't walk in the freedom of the Spirit. And what we end up doing is we actually get this guy and we go, oh, well, uh, if he still needs to play a part in my life, if, I'm, if he's yoked to me, then I better do something about this, this guy. And we end up prettying up. <laughs> oh, I broke it. Sorry, Jeff. Don't worry, I didn't use that today, only yesterday. Listen to me. I just wanted to do that. That's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> we, listen to me. We end up prettying up and pushing forward ego. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. I can do it. I can. And, and, and what the law does, it says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And you're living with this dead body that stinks. Sorry, Jeff. And doesn't look that good with lipstick anyway. And so what the Spirit of God wants to do is He wants to come and He wants to set you free from... uh, I'm going to get this. He wants to set you free. He wants to set you free from the dead man. And then He wants to say, come, Gary, I've got a shovel here. We didn't do this in the first... Let's bury this guy. Let's put... Let's actually ensure... (laughs) Let's, yeah, just make sure he's dead first. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> and so I put... And so, and so the reason a lot of people end up struggling in their walk with God is because they're dragging around this nature that the Bible says reckon dead. Reckon it dead. Consider it dead. Don't give it any room and walk in obedience to the Spirit. And so when we find freedom from both our sin nature uh, and then what the law wants to do with our sin nature, we are then free to walk at the pace of the Spirit. It's light and easy. He's got you. And, and any time the enemy or the accuser wants to come along and say, what about the law? You go, well, the, the, the advocate, the Holy Spirit goes, no, 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 that was broken in Christ. He died with Christ. And then you walk in the freedom that God has for you. You guys can grab your seats. Paul was adamant. Good, good job, guys. Paul was adamant about this. You can't walk in true freedom. This is why all of Galatians chapter 4 deals with the, the, the bond woman. Listen to me. The bond woman and her son and the free woman and her son. It's actually... Cast out the bondwoman. Give no room for that yoke in your life because if you allow that yoke to enter into your life, then you will actually not walk in true freedom. It's only as you cast out the bondwoman. It's only as you allow the, the, the yoke of legalism to be broken and the yoke of the sin nature to be broken and reckon yourself dead to sin, alive to Christ, that you begin to walk the light and easy walk in the freedom of the Spirit. And a lot of people, 
And I want to apologise for this. A lot of people have been discipled into a double yoke. In fact, what happens? (laughs) Some people get saved and they're so free. And they're like, man, like... It's, it's actually like there's an ease, ease to this thing. And then they meet a beautiful Christian who probably is a bit more like a Judaizer than they realise and say, wow, hold on a minute. You need to sort out your smoking. You need to deal with your drinking. You need to fix this and this and this and this. And then what that person does is they then go, oh, Well, the dead body matters. And they begin to conform their life externally to the expectations and obligations of religion instead of actually allowing the life and freedom of the Spirit in relationship with, with of course, voices who are giving direction and correction. I'm not against that. But the life and freedom of the Spirit to bring them into freedom. And, And here's the deal. When you... So, so many people so many people feel like their Christianity is fake. And if I was to be honest with some people and, and you were honest with me today, there might even be some people here today and you're like, I've got my mask back on. I put it back on. Because you've got a dead guy on the inside and you still think he's alive. And what the Spirit of God wants to do is He wants to help you come into the revelation of what Christ has done for you as your advocate. And He wants to help you bury that guy so that you can actually bring down the walls and breathe out. Stop trying to pretend because whenever we got them up, we're not really letting Holy Spirit in to do what He needs to do on the inside of us. And the Spirit-led life looks like freedom. It's light. It's easy. Yeah, there's moments where things happen and life gets tough. But it's not burdensome. Ben, you can join me today and because the reality is when you walk like this, guess what happens? In your wake, so you've got a yoke, you've got a walk, it's light and easy. And then in your wake, what does the Bible say happens when you walk in the Spirit? You produce the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. And in your wake is it love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness. Do you know how fruit's produced? I didn't say this in the first service. Seed comes into contact with the womb of a plant. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Seed comes into contact with the womb and then fruit appears. The seed is the word of God. And as it comes into contact with the Spirit of God, we produce fruit. And we don't strive to make the, produce that fruit. We don't force it out. It's a byproduct, hear me. Even natural fruit, human fruit, is a byproduct of intimacy. And you're never going to walk in intimacy if every time you get in the room, with the Spirit of God. Had dead guys there. This is a bit awkward. What about him? There is a yoke that is light, it's easy, it's free. And if you allow him to lead your life and guide your life, your Christianity will feel like a joy. 
Like it's meant to be enjoyable. I talk to people. I mean, I was talking. I'm not going. I talk to people sometimes, and I'm like, "Bro, I'm tired for you. Like I'm tired for you. It's it's exhausting hearing you speak about your faith because you just like stop, breathe out, breathe in the spirit, trust in Him, reset." Cast off the yoke of bondage and walk in the freedom of the Spirit. Can we stand this morning? With every head bowed and, and every eye closed and no one looking around, this, is, this moment is between you and the Holy Spirit. Can we just put our hands out in front of us just like we're ready to receive a gift. The Bible says this, Jesus said this, if, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in Heaven want to give you the Holy Spirit? I just feel there are some people here today and you've never felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I just, I just want to just come against the, the overthinking in Jesus' name. I bind it in Jesus' name. The complication in Jesus' name. The what ifs in Jesus' name. The what happens if I let go of control in this moment and let God in. What's actually going to happen? Lord, I break the spirit of religion over people's minds in Jesus' name. The yoke of bondage. And I declare freedom indeed. He who the Son sets free, come on, is free indeed, is free indeed. Lord, I pray for a greater revelation of freedom in every heart and every life. And as we open up our hands, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to take control, to take the lead, to lead us. Come on, He's not gonna lead you anywhere that is harmful. He's God, He loves you, He's for you, He's your advocate. He's not the voice of accusation. He's the voice of advocacy. And so Holy Spirit, You are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill this room. Fill every heart. Come on, every heart, just open up to Him right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood. Know those words seeing them. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Sing Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the
whose heart is open right now. Father, for those who are here today who are yet to make you Lord of their life, we pray this prayer, this simple prayer of invitation. Can we pray these words? Jesus, I invite you to be my Lord. Forgive me, wash me clean, make me new, fill me with your spirit. Amen. Amen. So what's next? What's next is just walking in His voice. It's light. It's easy, church. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcook it. Come on.